Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome to our vocabulary lesson today, lesson number seven. Before we start, I just wanted to make a few comments or observations. Um, first is that you will realize and, uh, that, and I have realized this myself, that I'm very different when I'm recording lectures and when I am actually teaching live in person. I tend to be more animated or more engaged um, or spirited when I actually see people in front of me and interact with them. That's just my nature and uh, that's probably true for many people. So, and, and I think you'll agree with that. And however, I wanted to comment on that is, 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 uh, and suggest the following. One is that a teacher's job is really never to, to entertain. I mean, teachers are not entertainers and teachers are not comedians. They're not meant to like make you, it's not like a TV show, you know what I'm saying? So this is very important for, for us to appreciate. And this is a very important message to carry and tell other people because that's kind of like our cultural expectations. The cultural expectation is that teachers are uh, some kind of entertainers. They have to make the class fu uh, you know, funny or in in entertaining for the student. And that's the mark of a good teacher from a cultural standpoint of view. However, I have to tell you about possibly some of the most important things that you, have, you will have to learn or you need to learn or you will learn uh, is, uh, is perhaps from teachers that you consider to be n not that engaging, not that, uh, quote, funny or entertaining. So in, in other words, you'll miss out on some very important stuff in life if you expect your education always to be entertaining. And that's something we have to go away from. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's just, uh, there's no shortcuts. Sometimes you just kind of have to like focus and sometimes you have to struggle and sometimes you have to really distract it and come back and do, do something over and over until you get it. So, so you don't want necessarily to have shortcuts inside in life because that's not going to happen all the time. So somebody who expects everything always to be, in, uh, to be easy is going to have a very difficult life. Let me repeat that again. Someone who expects everything to be easy all the time, they're going to have a very difficult and hard life all the time. Not all the time, of course, but many times. So don't, don't expect that. And don't expect that from your teachers. They're not, they're not Hollywood entertainers. They're not stand-up comedians. They are teachers, right? And they may have something very important to teach you. Now, that's, that's, that's one thing. The other thing, uh, before we start, I also know that uh, your homework assignment basically is to write these words, as you know, uh, with a simple definition and twice and then send it to me. I know that, you know, you might be tempted and none of you will do this, I know. You, somebody might be tempted that, you know, you'll just write the words and, and find the uh, meaning and the sentence and, you know, save yourself some uh, time by not listening to uh, the, the, uh, the whole thing. Well, that's up to you, but I, I don't think you will do that, you know. The reason for that is, of course, it's easy to do that. And we know that from private discussions, education ultimately will have to be limited to those people who want to learn. Uh, otherwise, the, the rest of it is just sheep herding, right? So you don't, you don't want to do that because you want to grow as a person every day. Tomorrow, you want to be better than you are today. You want to be more knowledgeable, more astute, more uh, uh, intellectually um, um, a, a pro, a, a advanced per individual than you are today, right? So, and that's very important. You don't, you, again, you don't want shortcuts. Just stick with it, have some stama, and try to do the best you can. So, you know, it's, it's like, if you have a, you know, if you, you know, you all have matured at, from, from the beginning of the year, and you can, you know that yourself, I don't even have to tell you that as a class, you have all matured, right? And you can tell kids, you, you're, you know, whoever, you, me, you can tell children when they have grown ups, and this is a, it's a good parameter. So, it, it's, a child is grown up when they do what they're supposed to be doing without having to be harassed about it or without having you know without having their parents tell them okay you know take out the garbage and this and that so you you know you're you mature you know you're a grown-up person uh, or you know somebody a, a child is grown up uh, if they do what they're supposed to be to do without having to be told and um, uh, if 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 a, if, a, if a child is being treated as a child and they feel like they're being being treated like a child, they may be treated like a child because they're behaving like children, right? So, 
so that's all these are all kind of important things I, I feel it's particularly so because of our current circumstances and I, I wish and I, and I anticipate that you will hopefully uh, learn here so, but I did think I, we could do this uh, 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 slightly differently and this time because uh, to go through all the words over here might get boring for you uh, the teachers should try to make the the task a little bit more in, in, engaging. So what I thought we'd do is actually start with the quotations and when we reach the appropriate quotation and go back and learn the, the, the word that might be kind of more in, an interesting way of doing things, okay? So, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim So let's start here again with the first quote. The quote says, the most immutable barrier in nature is between one man's thoughts and another's. Okay, so we have to know what the word immutable means. So we go up there, immutable, here's the word immutable. I'm sorry, I just kind of like lost the thing. So how are you today? All right, so, alhamdulillah. So here's immutable. Immutable is unchangeable, right? So when you like, so when you mute something, you just kind of stop it. Say this, you cannot, you know, if something cannot be muted, it's immutable, it means it cannot be changed. So, immutable is something that's unchangeable, permanent, inveterate is, is, is kind of like unchanged, but like in a stubborn way. An inveterate criminal is some a criminal that won't be like rehabilitated, so to speak, for example. So, immutable, unchangeable, something that cannot be changed, something that mutates, for example. It changes, right? So mutable is something that is changes or something that mutates. So the opposite of mute, mutable or something that mutates is immutable. Protean uh, is something that has many different forms. So it's it's not exactly an anonym, but so a protean means like, uh, uh, as for example, there's a sentence that every illness has protean manifestation. I mean, every disease presents with many in many different forms. Vacillating is, is changing, going up and down, up and down, changing all the time. Mercurial, we'll, we see, we'll see this word, mercurial is somebody who basically changes their mood a lot. Some, a person that's mercurial is somebody who's like, gets angry easily, okay? So that's immutable. So immutable means unchangeable. Now let's go back to our sentence here, see what this person is trying to say. The most immutable barrier in nature, I mean something that that's most difficult to overcome, something that doesn't change, some, right? The most immutable, the most difficult barrier, they're trying to say, in nature is between one man's thoughts and another's. In other words, we can't tell what other people are thinking, right? So it's it's very difficult barrier to cross. This, this could mean that it's hard for us people to read other people. This could also mean that it's very difficult to try to uh, convince other people to change their minds, all right? So it's very uh, it's very difficult uh, to uh, to appreciate people. That's one possible meaning of this. Also, uh, it's very difficult to change other people's minds. That's what they're saying, perhaps. And there's another quotation here about immutable. Perfection is immutable, but for things imperfect, there is the way to perfect them. Change is the way to perfect them. Okay, I kind of messed that up. So it's the same word, immutable. Make my eraser over here. So. So perfection is immutable. That means per perfection is something that cannot be changed. Something that's, there's only, let's like, say, one perfect, in, philoso in philosophy, you say there's one perfect form, and everything that's imperfect is trying to reach that perfection. So what they're saying over here is perfection is immutable, but for things that are imperfect, the way they reach perfection is change. Since we're all imperfect things, we're all imperfect, we like to, nobody's perfect, right? So. But we should try to uh, try to be better people. The way we do that is we we change, and you know um, I think it was Muhammad Ali who said you know it's like uh, uh, if thirty years go by and you're the same person that you were thirty years ago, you just wasted thirty years, and that's very true. So we want to be better people every day. We want to change in a, in a positive sense uh, every day. So perfection is immutable, but for things that are imperfect, uh, change is the way to uh to perfect them or to to move towards perfection so we'll read sentence number three over here so you can write these words uh, you know 
you can pause the thing and you can write all these definitions down if you like right and then you can go go back and listen okay so the next word here is uh, metamorphosis metamorphosis is a transformation uh, transformation is change right as in transformers so uh, metamorphosis is a, is a transformation but the the difference between transformation and metamorphosis is a tr metamorphosis is like a complete transformation uh, and for example a a, um, a caterpillar uh, the classic example for a caterpillar turning into fly uh, into into a butterfly nobody ever can would have guessed that a uh, butterfly's origins were in the caterpillar and the caterpillar's future was the butterfly so that's a complete transformation so metamorphosis uh, is uh, is a complete transformation the word metamorphosis is very if, is in, in, interesting uh, if you break it down meta means beyond the word meta means beyond okay uh, as in uh, metaphysics which means beyond the physics uh, beyond the physical world um, and uh, morph is to change right so metamorphosis is just not any morph or to change it is like beyond any change that you can imagine so to speak right so that's metamorphosis transformation okay another word for that is trans uh, transmogrification that's a fancy fancy word of saying transformation okay so that's metamorphosis so let's see what sentence we have about metamorphosis this is Rolf Waldo Emerson who was the um, uh, friend and mentor of uh, of Thoreau so in, in the in the first uh, first part of the uh, first half let's just say of the 1800s so uh, Emerson's saying this um, for if for if in any manner we can stimulate this instinct new passages are open for us into nature uh, our instinct so he's saying there's something in us that we can do to open ourselves up so for any manner we can stimulate this instinct that's that's in us new passages are open for us into nature the mind flows into and through things hardest and highest and the metamorphosis is possible so both Emerson and Thoreau were nature people. They that's why you know, Thoreau went into the Walden and Wald, the property of Walden Pond is actually belonged to Emerson, uh, and and uh, so they they were very big on nature. So they said that you have to go uh, be in nature and be connect with the world. Yeah, as, as Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, Inna fi samawati wal ardi These are all ayahs of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So if we if we can engage with the environment, it stimulates a certain instinct think that certain passages open and uh, it, it makes us think and connect and and that is a uh, good uh, there's truth in this I have two more statements here on metamorphosis which are I thought were interesting so this first one says here I'm, I'm reading over here see I'm reading over here so um, people are capable of profound metamorphosis that is change and this is kind of like uh, exaggeration, right? Metamorphosis self implies profound change, right? So it's kind of a little bit redundant, uh, but but that's fine because they're trying to emphasize not just any change, but they're like profound metamorphosis, like meta metamorphosis, like double metamorphosis. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, so uh, people are capable of profound metamorphosis, though unfortunately, uh oh, so it means people are capable of. A lot of change though unfortunately they rarely avail themselves they uh, rarely avail themselves here avail means to they make they make use of it or make themselves available to it for example so they pe people are are capable of profound metamorphosis they're saying so people have this capacity they're able to make a lot of change but unfortunately they don't they don't uh, take advantage of it they don't do this people can change but they don't do this they rarely avail themselves of this genius genius is this ability to transform themselves now why is that you would say well they're going to tell us hopefully force of habit force of habit being an even greater enemy of change than cowardice. this is very profound actually what they're saying is you and I are capable of profound transformations of ourselves we can be something remarkable we can be remarkable human beings and uh, we have this capacity all of us do and I believe that to be the case and uh, people are capable of being great human beings of great people but we don't take advantage of this inner genius that Allah gave us why 
not because uh, we are cowards. That's what they're saying. It's not because we are cowards. They're saying it's not because we are cowards. We're not cowards. We 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 uh, we have the courage. They're saying why? But because of habit, force of habit. We don't break our habits. This is so profoundly true. Very, very profoundly. So if you want to uh, uh, um, uh, transform yourself, what you do is you see what your bad habits are and you try to work on your bad habits slowly. Let's say somebody, you know, uh, watches too much, you know, TV or, or internet so much and that's, they, they want to change that. So you, you work on that. You identify that. You know it's a habit and you have to break, learn how to break habits and slowly able to transform uh, yourself so and transformation in general takes time you know it's not like usually boom like this and then you're like transform into a butterfly or something like that so you have to be patient you have to be forgiving you, have, you can't you can't be too hard on that but this is a very profound statement here I think which uh, uh, is uh, something to think about that we are capable of profound metamorphosis we have the capacity but it is the force of habit that's our enemy and it's not cowardice which is a very interesting statement this next one I also like, uh, it says, the clothes you wear are a metamorphosis. They change you from the outside in. And this is very true. The, this concept of change from the outside in. So there are two ways of changing yourself as a, as a person. Okay. So it, it, here's, here's me, for example. I can change myself from the inside out. I can change my thoughts and the thoughts will determine my actions. But what I can do is I can also make my change outside in. If I dress in a certain way, for example, I start acting and my, and my feelings and my thoughts will change. That's why it's very important how you present yourself. If you present yourself like not you necessarily, if somebody presents themselves as a slacker, they will be a slacker. But if they present themselves as somebody who, who's, you know, who's intellectual, who's uh, hardworking, who, um, who's a good human being and, and then it will uh, it will affect them eventually and this has been this is actually true this has been proven from from psychological studies that uh, how uh, the, you 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 can change from inside out or you can change from outside in for uh, for example you know people's mood can change if somebody could be perfectly happy and then they uh, they listen to not that you would listen to but i'm just saying that they listen to like sad song for example then all of a sudden they're sad and that's very true because it triggers certain memories and certain circuits in the brain that makes them you know, sad, depressed. So when somebody is sad, the last thing you want to do is, is expose yourself to things that are sad or more sad. And then that makes things worse. In fact, if you're, if you're somebody sad, then you want to expose yourself to like, you know, something, you know, funny or, or, or people are happy or something like that. Right. So, and it's very important. So here to the point that your clothes make a difference it's very true that's why if you come you know um, uh, you as you all do you're, you're beautiful uh, 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 Dar Salaam students as you as you all do you come with a certain attire as uh, certain proprieties a certain decorum to, to the mother's side you come to school uh, in 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 good clothing right so you know m myself here I'm sitting over here I have you know I have a I, I have uh, my uh, topi on and I have my in fact I have my Dar Salaam uh, handband on it's just Dar Salaam my family knows I'm, I'm kind of obsessed by it so and it's because why it's important to me it affects the way I interact with you right and I, you know, I'm, I always teach with wudu as you know because that's important because one I care about my students and I think there's baraka in it so if, I, if I'm in a state of wudu it will affect the way I see myself and, and how I uh, represent myself so it's very important and how you present yourself from the outside and so in, it's how how you are at home also makes a difference if you at, even at home you should have be presentable at home this is so important because who's more important to you in your life than the people who are in, who are surrounding you immediately right so you should be presentable to your family uh, that's actually very very important and so um, so your clothes make make a difference. You know, in the same way, your haircut makes a difference, um, and how a person uh, walks make a difference, right? So, very important concept. So, if you appreciate this, and and I hope and I hope that you do, uh, it will help you in life. So, outside in, inside out approach to to change. That's metamorphosis, profound change. All right. So let's see what we got. Number four. We we'll read the sentence and go back. 
all history is nothing but a succession of crises. Oh no, we talk about pertinent, right? All history is nothing but a succession of crises of rupture. Rupture is like a break, you know, something ruptures, breaks. Repudiation, like rejection and, and resistance, okay? Uh, repudiation, negation, rebuttal, uh, and resistance, okay? Where there is no crisis, there is stagnation, petrification, and death. <laughs> you know, Ionesco. So, there's a lot in this sentence. Uh, I think it's actually a, a positive statement, and and uh, in other words, as as Muftinhaj was telling us uh, uh, yesterday, he, he, then he uh, he was telling us all the good things, all the lessons, uh, that all the benefits that we can uh, capture even uh, are of, in in a state of of crisis. So let's officially go upstairs and hear higher up and get the official definition of the word rupture. So rupture is to break open, burst. Fissures, fissures like you cut a tear, like a, you know, if somebody has a paper cut, that's like a little fissure in your skin, and cleave. So rupture is to break open, right? A pimple rupture, uh, kind of changes your mood, doesn't it? Uh, anyways, so a rupture is to break. So they're saying here, all history is nothing but a succession of crises, all right? I don't necessarily agree with that part of the statement. It's not necessarily crisis. It seems like that because we emphasize the crises. You know, there's a lot of times, even now, you know, people at home, they're, you know, uh, parental love has always been there. Parents have always loved their children. So how, how can one say that all of history is a succession of crises? Because parents have always loved. I don't see that as a crisis. I see that as a, a bedrock, a foundation of civilization. But anyways, it seems like it is. I, I, if, I would, if I were to write this sentence, I would say all history seems to be a succession of crises. But I'm not uh, criticizing this individual. But you know, I might have... They might have revised their sentence too later in their life. Who knows? But anyways, all history is nothing but a succession of crises, uh, of rupture, of breaking, repudiation, and resistance. Where there is no crisis, there is stagnation, petrification, and that petrification is like you know, dying, like decaying, like a, a dead body petrifies, you know, decays. That's petrification and death. So what they're saying is crises, it's not that you should you should want crises in life. A crisis, they just happen. But there's there's some there's some good the benefit that you can get from the crises. You can realize what you what you had uh, even in, in, in crisis. And then it rejuvenates us. It, it makes us kind of wakes us up, kind of resuscitates us to think, hey, look, well, you know, don't take anything for granted, right? So that's which is, I think, the uh, sentiment in the next sentence too over here, which we shall read. Now look, listen carefully. Listen carefully, dear student. So look, awareness requires a rupture with the world. This is a very interesting statement. See, awareness mean, meaning that to be aware of the world, to understand the world, to be wise about it, uh, to be present, uh, if, in, to be engaged in life, to not go through life like a zombie. So what they're saying is this is the opposite of being a zombie. Awareness is like opposite of being a zombie sleepwalking through life. So awareness requires a rupture with the world as we uh, world we take for granted. So sometimes we need a break from the world that we take for granted. Like not just to you know go out there you know go for a holiday vacation, but here they're trying to suggest a rupture, complete break, right? A rupture like we're having presently because of a, of this virus business. So be, uh, currently we we are experiencing this certain rupture from the world that we we had taken for granted. So we completely divorced from the uh, pre the previous way we used to live. But indeed, that has, I hope it has, uh, uh, increased your awareness of, of, uh, uh, of, of life, okay? Because when this happens, they're telling us, when there's a rupture like this that you're experiencing, then old categories, old categories of experiences, that is, everything that we consider to be good, happy, everything that we consider to be sad and not so good, are called into question and revised. In other words, you thought your life was tough before, what do you think now, right? And uh, you know, you might you might have missed uh, 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 um, uh, certain things before, um, and now you missed them more. And so, um, so what you consider to be good and what you consider to be difficult times, the whole concept changes because of of the uh, of a rupture or distancing from what we ordinarily take to be granted. Indeed. Uh, 
uh, there are lessons to be learned in, from difficulties for those uh, who uh, who are ready to learn. I thought that's also a good sentence over here. All right, so let's see next, number five here. The most important lesson, well, that's some like an important sentence to begin with. The most important lesson that man, this is a very general statement, profound statement, you know, they're generalizing, so we better pay attention, right? Uh, Rabindranath Tagore, he's an Indian poet and writer and he's a very smart guy uh, and um, of the last century. So the most important lesson that man can learn from his life is not that there is pain in the world. That's grand to see. That's the thing. People say, how come there's so much pain in the world? Well, get used to it because that's the way it always was and that's the way it always will be. That's nothing new in, in the world. I mean, if the life is tough for you, well, it was tough for the generation before you and the generation before you. And it has always been difficult. Every, I mean, if every generation complains of how tough life is, because that's nothing exceptional. We're not, that's given. Right? Unless it's a So, the, he's, he's saying that's true. If, if the most important lesson, is, it's not a lesson that to let us a pain life. That's what he's saying. The most important lesson that man can learn in his life is, is that is not that there is pain in this world because it's not that that's not an important lesson because that's duh, everybody knows that he's saying but that it depends on him it depends on us to turn it into good account that it is possible for him to transmute it into joy transmute is to change to transform that's what he's saying so you can take the pain and suffering and transmute it into joy okay so transmute as in mutation is to transform metamorphosis and uh, metamorphs alter or transmogrify transmogrify so transmute is to change right to cause the mutation to ch cause change so to speak so what he's saying is this is also very profound the most important lesson that man can learn from life is that not that there is pain in the world but that it depends on us it depends on us how we how we interact with this suffering and, and pain that is in the world it depends on us okay uh, turn it into turn it into good look we can turn all the suffering into good for example you know you can smile at people you know, smile is charity that's not a very it's not a true obviously it's not a simple thing it's very important if people go out with frowns they don't smile at anybody what kind of life is that you get up in the morning and you decide you're not going to smile at people what's up with that right what kind of people are those but at least you can do a smile right don't make things life harder right for for, for yourself or for anybody else smile Yes, it's tough. Yeah, is, is it that hard to smile? No, it's, they say it's, it's, it's easier to smile than to frown, and, and from a physiological point of view, right? And so, anyway, so turn it into good. You can do good to people. How else are you going to do good to people if they don't need anything from you, right? So you can change this. And this is this, now. See, people like Rabindranath Tagore, they they don't they choose their word carefully. They don't they don't say stuff just because they want to say pretty things. They change because they they know that that they want to do good. They want to help you live a better life. So look at this word, and they choose their words very carefully. He's saying that it is possible for you to transmute, that you can change what they're saying. You can not only you make it better, you can change this pain. And you can turn it into joy. That's pretty pretty profound. Think about that for a second. Think about that. If you if you mom dad if, you, if they're sad for whatever reason, and then if they uh, if they're in, uh, uh, then you go and give, and give them a hug, right? So how 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 wonderful would that be for your parent, right? You you can totally change their their pain into a profound joy, right? So this is, and he's saying you can't just make it better. You can actually change it. You can transform it into something very good. And this is very true. You think these times are tough, but these times are opportunities to do great things. Every challenge is just and basically an opportunity to do great things. All right, number six to so transmute. All right, number six. The administration has got to get its act together. This is. Joe Biden. This I, I picked this sentence a long time ago. By the way, it has, it has nothing to do with our current political circumstances. So um, uh, um, the administration has got to get it act together. I think he's actually talking about um, uh, whatever he's talking about. Let's, but it's not from our current circumstance. Don't give me this amorphous uh, malarkey about uh, about we'll stay there until the job is done. They're talking about probably our troops in a foreign country. 
So malarkey is nonsense. This is a fancy word of, you can learn. If you want to learn a fancy word to impress people, you learn this word malarkey, uh, which means nonsense. What kind of malarkey is this? No. Okay. So, so he's saying amorphous. The, the word the vocabulary is amorphous. So amorphous is without form. Morphous is to change forms, right? So amorphous is like having no form. A is means the word. The, the letter A means A without, right? Uh, um, atypical is something that's not typical. Amorphous is something uh, that, that morph is a form. Amorphous is something that does not have form. So amorphous is something that does not have shape. Uh, is uh, uh, something that changes all the time. Okay. Uh, synonyms: shapeless, nebulous, vague, nondescript. Antonym is crystalline. Now, amorphous. If you use it for a thought, somebody's thought is amorphous. That means it's not formed. Their their the ideas are not clear. Their ideas are nebulous. They're unclear. Nebula, you know, is where stars are born. It's vague. It's like like that. So shapeless, vague, nondescript is is this, it's not clear. On the opposite of it, it's crystalline. Somebody's thoughts are crystalline, but they're perfect in their shape. Their their their, their thoughts are perfect, uh, unassailable thoughts. So that's amorphous. So amorphous is without form. So he's saying, don't give me this uh, non uh, with shapeless nonsense about that the, uh, that we're going to stay there. Our troops are stay there until their job is done because that feels like a nice thing to say. They're saying, don't give me this meaningless talk. Get, get us, get your act together. Do something positive. Uh, and they're talking about troops in a foreign country. Okay, that's that. Number seven. Just, okay, just let's, uh, if you're wondering, let's see how many sentences there are over here. Okay. There's 12. Number seven. He, number seven. He would just do it. He was a very talented guy, but very mercurial and quick. That's Yoko Uno. Uh, she's the wife of John Lennon, singer. Uh, I don't know much about them, but that's who she is. Um, she's talking about him. And mercurial is somebody who's like easily angered. You know, something like that. Uh, erratic, subject to wild changes in character. Uh, apparently from a, the speedy Greek mythological god named Mercury. Uh, Mercurial is erratic and somebody changes the uh, 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 mood typically uh, very quickly. And it's, does, it has a slightly negative connotation, okay? Fickle, capricious, vacillating. Somebody changes a lot. Capricious is like whimsical. Like, let's, like you know, capricious is like, hey, let's go, let's go uh, get some donuts, and then you just go get some donuts, and then you, you have like a big exam coming up next day, and you waste like two hours or something like that. Not that anyway. If you would do that, capricious is like whimsical, just on on the spot decision making type thing. Opposite of mercurial, immutable. We talked, we, we've seen this word, immutable, unchangeable. The opposite of something that changes a lot is immutable, stable. So mercurial. So let's go back to Yoko Ono. So he, he, she's saying he was, he, he would just do something. He was very talented, but he was very mercurial and quick. He would, he would change. And number eight, example of hyperbole. He's a million years old. Yeah, I just had, there are very there are many good examples of the, some funny ones, but I I, I kind of didn't want to be funny on this. But hyperbole means exaggeration, exaggerated statement or claims not meant to be taken literally, right? Man, this this lesson is like you know you know a, a hundred hours long. That would be another hyperbole. So hyperbole is the, or he's a million years old. That's like exaggeration. It's actually uh, uh, not true. So uh, hyperbole. So, like he was, the, he was the greatest, fastest runner ever, uh, the turtle. So it's like, so it's, that's easy enough. Number nine. The search for a scapegoat is the easiest for all human expeditions. This is Dwight Eisenhower. This uh, he was a five-star general. He was the leader of the all the uh, armies, navies, air force. Uh, during the Second World War for the United States. He went on to become a very popular United States President Eisenhower. So, and uh, um, he's the leader of the Allied forces in Second World War. The search for a scapegoat. What is a scapegoat? Scapegoat is a person, you know, uh, uh, who is blamed for everything wrong. So something goes wrong, you blame them. Oh, he did it. So that's the scapegoat. A person, whether they, you know, uh, 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 they did it or not and typically they're innocent they you blame the innocent person a person who's blamed for the wrongdoing mistakes or faults of others especially for reasons of expediency just to be quick you know so in other words if you want to f f distract you know okay who, whose fault is all this people want somebody 
to blame, you know, because like they have like a, 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 a tangible uh, individual to express their anger against. So scapegoat is somebody who's blamed for all the problems. So he's saying, now he's used to expeditions, you know, because he's like the five-star journalist. But he's saying the search for scapegoat is the easiest of all hunting expeditions. It's very easy to find scapegoats. He's saying. Right, you can easy. You know the fascinating thing about about Eisenhower is that it's t he's, this is a very interesting, ironic statement because when when the the Allied forces uh, landed on Normandy, that's like the beachfront, and then the you know I forget exactly how many, but uh, I'm guessing thousands and thousands of people. I have to look that up maybe for next time. Died just landing the Allied troops on the uh, the Normandy beaches of France to as they were going to fight back and come back against Hitler. So when they were going to land and it was it was not exactly uh, predetermined that that's going to be a successful expedition. And uh, D D Dwight uh, Eisenhower, as being the leader of the whole uh, uh, shebang, and he if if anything went wrong if they failed and it would be like he would have to take responsibility for it in fact he had before before the invasion started on normandy he wrote a, 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 a speech where in case in case uh, the expedition failed in, in that speech he actually uh, took all the blame all the responsibility for the failure because he was the ultimate uh, leader of the allied forces so uh, he, he was a, some he was a quiet genius he was a, he was a, a amazing amazing person it's a, a biography worth reading so that's dwight eisenhower number 10 let me embrace the sour adversity for wise men say it is the wisest course William Shakespeare. Now, William Shakespeare didn't quote say this. Okay, He's, this is well, probably from one of his plays or uh, uh, um, from from one of his writings. Uh, some character in his uh, uh, or poems, whatever, says this. So when he says William Shakespeare, it's not, we actually don't even know who he was in a way. But his adversities, challenges in life, challenges or difficulties in life, difficulties, misfortune. So Shakespeare is saying, telling us, he's saying. Let me embrace thee. In other words, some this is very profound too. See, if some difficulties happen, there are two types of people. They one, the whiners, they complain a lot, and I've, this is this is true. Like even in, in hospitalized patients, there you know people say patients who have cancer and sometimes they have a very difficult time dealing with it. And then their cancer patients are very peaceful and they're they they are um, you know uh, they they accept their condition. And some of them, they, they can't, and they all the way to the end, they, they can't, they're not in peace. And it's very difficult to see. So what he's saying here is, n number 10, let me embrace thee. Now, he's, this is called personification, if you remember from writing, uh, this personification of adversity. Um, it's a rhetorical ele element, personification. Sour means, you know, obviously sour adversity, sour difficulty. Instead of, you know, of fighting you difficult times, let me just embrace you. I got this. You know, this is tough. Okay, I'm going to just embrace this. I'm going to go with it. I'm going to make the best out of it. Okay? And he's saying, for wise men say it is the wisest course. Right? Instead of fighting adversity, instead of always complaining how bad things are, he says, okay, got it. You know, it's, it's bad. Let's see what you can do. Let's make the best out of it. That's what he's saying. That's uh, that's a pretty true and profound statement. Also, number 11 is another sentence with the word uh, adversity. 11. Prosperity makes friends. Adversity tries them. Beautiful. Prosperity is good times. Makes friends. When, when things are going very good, when people have a lot of friends, you know, people come, hey, you know, blah, 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 blah. But when it's difficult times, then you find out who's your real friend. A friend in need is a friend indeed, right? That's what they say. So prosperity makes friends, adversity tries them. All right? Number 12. Is that in the last one? Yes, that's the last one. Sure. Number 12. The secret of a demagogue. Ooh, is demagogue. Important word. Demagogue, demagogue. Let's go. Demagog, a political leader who seeks uh, support by appealing to the desires and prejudices of ordinary people rather than by using rational argument. So in other words, a demagogue is a political 
leader who panders, who kind of caters to uh, the desires and prejudices and the fears uh, and uh, of uh, of ordinary people and, the, and and manipulates them to their own political benefit. Uh, okay, so that's a demagogue. So a demagogue is a political leader who takes advantage of uh, uh, desires, prejudices, and fears of the ordinary people. It's not a good quality. And obviously, de demagogues are not good. Um, the secret of the demagogues is very interesting. You might think they're dumb people. So uh, demagogues, they look kind of, you know, they don't look very sophisticated, but sometimes they're very, 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 they usually are very, 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 very sophisticated. The secret of the demagogue is to appear as dumb. See? <laughs> they appear as dumb as his audience. As their audience. So they appear as dumb as their audience so that these people can believe, so those people they're trying to fool can believe themselves as smart as he is. So he's, he, you know, this guy has figured it out. He's, he's a common guy. He's like us. He understands us, you know. So the, the secret of the demagogue is to appear as dumb as his audience so that these people can believe themselves as smart as he is. Yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, he, we, we got it. You know, he's, he understands us type of thing. So Harry's on half truths and one and a half truths uh, selected aphorisms. Aphorisms are smart, pity, pity sayings. Okay, so that it concludes our, our vocabulary list. And I hope you, um, I hope you enjoyed, for one thing. And um, I hope you learned these words. Uh, until next time, as-salatu wa-salam wa-rasulillah wa-alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. As-salamu alaykum.